Welcome to Plan Stronger TV. I'm your host, David Holland. Money is changing. In some respects, finances are getting easier and simpler. In other respects, it's getting a lot more complicated. How do you deal with all that? I'm joined on today's program by Dr. Art Markman to discuss the psychological impact of these changes. Let's roll. And welcome, Dr. Art Markman in the studio with me today. Welcome, Art. It is good to be here. Good to see you. So thanks for traveling all the way to our studios here in Daytona Beach, Florida. It is lovely. So Austin, Texas. Yes. Don't mess with Texas. Right. At least Talk not with Austin. Horns. There you go. There you go. So Art, um, I've enjoyed talking with Art. We've done radio programs together and enjoyed having him in the studio with us. So uh, a little bit of background about Art. He is a... Uh, Professor of Psychology and Marketing, University of Texas at Austin, PhD in Psychology from University of Illinois, and also is the author of the book, Smart Thinking, Three Essential Keys to Solve Problems, Innovate, and Get Things Done. Don't we all? Yes. <laughs> and also, to keep his schedule full, he is the co-host of Two Guys on Your Head with Dr. Bob Duke, and that program is a podcast and radio stations. That's right. Yeah. And you do a fair amount of speaking and traveling. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Even even to Daytona Beach. Even to Daytona Beach. Well, we're very glad to be added to your list of, of wonderful destinations. So um, I'm so glad to have Art on the program because we've got to talk about the psychology of money. And that sounds like the, a college course or maybe a dissertation. But money is changing, yeah. as you well know. And paper currency is used less and less. And how that affects people and their decision making um, that's a real key thing I think we should dig into a little bit yeah. and take advantage of your expertise in the area because I think for so many people, um, they may be aware of it or maybe not aware of it, but it is definitely having an impact. So tell us what to look out for and maybe some things we can do to make better decisions. Yeah. So let's set the stage. All right. Okay. Go back a thousand years and generally speaking, you didn't really deal with money at all. You, you traded, you bartered. Right. So, so you had some stuff, somebody else had some stuff, and you tried to figure out how to, how to create some sense of equal value for that. Now we move forward and societies are, are uh, broader, and so people aren't coming into contact with all the same people all the time. So we need to have a more uniform way mm -hmm. of keeping track of value. So now governments start to create currency systems in which there's a, uh, and, and in which there's some agreement that, that these uh, coins have value. And initially they were coins and they were made out of precious metals, silver, right. gold, things like that. And we could use that as a way of creating value. So now it's getting a little bit more abstract. I mean, three chickens is one thing, a certain amount of gold, that's, you know, I gotta, I gotta think a little harder about that. Then we start creating paper currencies right. where the actual thing you're holding doesn't really have any value at all, but, but for a while at least it's backed by that metal. So now it's getting a little more abstract. Then it gets even more abstract because now it's not even backed by the metal anymore. It's mm -hmm. the full faith and credit right, of right, the right. United States they government. agreed upon exchange rate. Right. And now we have reached the age of what I like to call the Republic credit. <laughs> so back when I was a kid and I watched Star Wars, you know, there, there was a transaction that takes place early in the movie in which somebody says, I'm going to pay a certain amount of Republic credits for this. And it was clear from the context that that was just like a value that was being changed on some, I don't know, computer system. And at the time, you're like, whoa, that's so weird. Money's yeah. not even a thing. Well, now we live in the age of the Republic credit because there, there's almost no physical manifestation of mm. our money anymore. You know, you, you can pay with a credit card and then pay off that credit card with a transfer directly from your bank account. Right. And at no point is there any physical object changing hands as part of that transaction. Now, the reason that all of that matters mm -hmm. is because we are attuned to really understanding the world based on tangible things that we can hold on to. 
when it becomes purely abstract, now all you're doing is transferring the idea of something. And it's mm. a lot easier to psych yourself up to part with an idea right. than it is to part with some physical stuff that was in your pocket and is now going to be in the pocket of somebody else. And so, and so now the value of the objects and services you're going to get in return feel much more real than the amount of money that you're giving up for them. Mm. Well, we've all had a variety of different experiences with purchases, cars, or just simply the new outfit at the mall, or whatever it is. A great tie. Yeah, a, a good, yeah, you gotta have good ties. And so you're making that purchase, and with this abstract or this idea, um, it's very different than if you actually had the currency in your hand. And we've talked about um, you know, buying a car. If you're actually having to count out, you know, say it's $15,000, you know, your negotiation may be a little different than simply signing forms and it's, well, your payment's going to be a $199 a month. Right. Right. And you won't even ever see it. It'll come out of your account electronically. And that, and that first payment isn't even till next month. Exactly. You got a whole right. month. It's forever oh, from now. Yeah. So all of that is changing our decision making. I think the, the key question is, do we run the risk of making poorly thought out decisions that may not be in our best interest? Where are, we, are we mortgaging tomorrow to live today? And that's exactly the point, is that is that right now we're not parting with anything, so we feel like the transaction isn't really that expensive. And what we don't recognize is how difficult it's going to be to be continuing to pay this off month mm. after month after month, perhaps for the next five years or even 10 years or 15 years. I know you can, you can get windows on your house and they'll, they'll, they'll loan you the money for right. 15 years. Right. Do you really want to be paying for those windows for the next 15 years? But it's only $10 a month. Oh, I mean, as a cup of coffee. So? But the thing is, you aren't thinking about all of the other things you might want to use that money for in mm. the future. And so in the moment, the goal of, of getting this thing seems so important that you're not really paying much attention to everything that's gonna, that, that, that this is going to get in the way of off into the future. It's sort of like, let me give you a different example. Somebody might say to you, would you like to go on this great vacation six months from now? And you're thinking, whoa, that'd be cool. I'd love to go to that place. I've never been there before. And so all you're thinking about is how cool it would be to go on that vacation. Yeah. Now, the week before that vacation, you're thinking, why did I agree to do this? <laughs> I'm so busy at work right. and I'm going to miss this event at home. I should never have agreed to do this thing. Well, it's not that you didn't know how busy your life was going to be in the future. It's just that when you think about things really abstractly, you don't think about everything you're giving up in order mm. to do this great thing. And the same thing happens with your money. If I give up money in the future in order to have this thing right now, I'm not really thinking carefully about all of the things that I'm giving up in the future in order to be able to have this thing right now. And my future self then has very little say That's true. in the decision <laughs> That's true. that I'm making right now, even though I'm making a decision for my future self. That's a, all of that is a big concept for our brains to handle because our brain, you, you've made a very good point, Art, of separating future versus present self. And, you know, our future self will be saying, why did you do that? Yeah. Oh, I know why. You were living in that moment and you thought, and we all have heard, well, it seemed like a good idea. idea at the time, yeah. <laughs> right. You didn't care, but your future self is you didn't care about me. Exactly. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So in this context, we have also not only the, the, um, movement away from that paper holding the money. But we've also got a financial system that is doing two things at once. In some respects, it's becoming very simple, very easy to do stuff. But at the same time, there's a tremendous amount. It's, it's almost like a mushroom of expanding complexity where financial instruments and investments and derivatives and all of this, I mean, you can, I can bet on the, you know, the, the future value of orange juice six months from now and place a bet that, you know, is so abstract. And if I win, it just goes right into my brokerage account. If I lose, it comes out. That's right. I mean, it's so we've got simple. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the most complicated time and the simple time. So how does all that um, factor into this process that you've already building on the, com 
the nature of detachment. Yeah. So part of the problem is now it becomes ever more difficult to, to even feel like you're making a good decision mm. because you don't even understand the complexity of the environment that you're living in. And there are times where it gets so complicated, it's not clear anybody understands mm. it, right? I mean, I think if anyone read Michael Lewis's The Big Short or, or watched the movie, one of the things that you discover from that, and that's a book that's all about the mortgage-backed securities uh, industry and the derivatives. The meltdown. Uh, and then, and ultimately the meltdown. One of the things that becomes clear is that there were very few people who actually understood the entirety of that market. Right. So, so these financial systems get, can get so complicated that even the experts have difficulty wrapping their heads around exactly what's going on. That's true. And, and when you're in that situation, then the consumers who might actually be purchasing some of those securities as part of their, their uh, financial portfolio, they're really really going to be in dire straits because it's not clear even the experts know what go, what's going on. I use that as a test when I'm looking at investments for clients. You'll, you'll appreciate this, that if I read it and if I don't understand it on a first reading, we're not using it. Yeah. Because if I can't get it on the first reading, I should not have to be in a room alone, quiet for 30 minutes with my glasses and the prospectus. If I can't do it first reading, we're not using it. Right, right. Because, and then, it, you know, you, you would be on the hook for trying to explain that to somebody else. And if they don't have any expertise at all. I'm on the hook for their comprehension. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so, and so that's, that's really the difficulty is that we've, we've gotten so good at playing with these numbers mm. that we're able to do things of remarkable complexity, which, which can be a benefit in, in certain ways. Uh, it can be really useful to, to create financial instruments from a business standpoint. Right. But when we then get to individual investors, um, we, we sometimes want to simplify things in ways that I think will help people to feel comfortable with the decisions that they're making and to really believe that they're making decisions that that are that, that they understand are going to be in their own best mm. interests in the long term because particularly when it comes to long term investments having some degree of comfort that what you've done is the right thing is important very few people want to spend their time worrying about their money no kidding and if you don't understand where your money is then it's very easy to begin to worry about it and I think, actually, I think that's healthy. I think if, they, if somebody does not know where their money is or how it's invested, and if they, they don't have a, 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 a ready grasp of that, I don't mean the ultimate details, but just a good overview, then maybe they need to step back and say, is this really the right way to do it? Yeah. And I, I, I want to ask this, because I think it's the next natural step. I'd love to, to take advantage of your perspective, Art, and ask this question. Where do you think all this goes? Because it seems like our society is becoming a a society of things getting easier, but at the same time, that easy button that we push links to a great deal of complexity on the underneath the surface. And it's almost like we've got this extraordinarily specialized system where I can see people not being able to n understand the transaction and almost always need a translator. That's right. And I think that one of the things that we need to do for people is to give them not just information, but opportunities to slow down their mm. engagement with money in general. So for example, we have minimized transaction costs to the point where somebody sees something online and they can buy it right away and have it almost immediately. In fact, uh, people are now, one, one of the largest growing segments of the, uh, of the economy ends up being things like in-app purchases right. in video games, right. in which people are buying virtual products with real money that's being pulled off of credit cards that they never see. What is that doing? It, it means I can buy something right now in the moment when I feel the most need to purchase it. Right. One of the nice things about physical money, coins, bills, is that it created some transaction costs. If I didn't have enough of that stuff in my pocket, I had to go somewhere to get it in order to be able to complete the transaction. And I think that actually um, slowing things down a little bit, making it a little bit harder to spend money mm. may actually be a benefit for people in terms of their ability to budget effectively True. and and to really think about what do I what do I really need right now? You know, and this is particularly true as we begin to think about kids who are growing up right. in the age of the Republic credit. 
because for them, the, there, there's, a, there's very little distance between the want to buy something and the ability to buy it. In fact, True. you know, Amazon has those buttons right now that you can stick, you know, in various <laughs> places in your house. You press the button and it places an order. And it shows up the next day. Right. And, and, and once you've, you've really made it so easy and so disconnected from the money itself, it becomes harder to recognize that actually you can't have everything you want in exactly the moment that you want it. And that makes the transition from kids who are growing up in households in which they're reasonably comfortable to their own young adulthood mm. so difficult. Because we, you know, we've all had our stories of sure. suddenly, you know, eating a lot of macaroni and cheese because we don't quite have everything that we that we need. But but that transition becomes more difficult to manage if you've always been in a situation in which everything that you wanted was at the touch of a button. And I think we have to, we have to help uh, you know, kids these days to understand that that, that, that that money has value, even though it's a bunch of numbers where, where the math itself might, might not actually even make complete sense to them at that point. Yeah, that, that's a, a, a good perspective. And, and I think the thing that's interesting, Art, is that you know, this idea of credit, it's yeah. a relatively new concept. You know, credit cards, what, the 1950s, 1960s maybe? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so we're not that far into it. You know, if our culture survives, which we all, of course, hope it does, and there are humans on the planet for, you know, millions of years right, or right. whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're only in a very, very small window here and thinking forward how all this is going to play out. But for the next generation, it's going to be some challenges. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that... that for a long time, there was credit, but you could only get that credit for really significant purchases for which you had significant True. collateral, True. right? So I, if I bought a home, I might be able to get uh, credit, but the house was up for collateral. Right. Or, or I might be able to get it for my business. I mean, we've had money lenders for a long time. What's fascinating is that now consumer credit is True. so easy to get in ways that allow people to essentially uh, get themselves into potentially significant trouble because their collateral is now themselves. We have lifestyle financing now. That's right. Because there's the removal, and I've got the poker chips, you know, there's a removal from that money. And even we've gone much further than just the poker chips. We're now dealing with a credit card. In that in-app purchase you talk about the video game, and you can make that purchase then and it goes against the credit card, and then the credit card is paid by a deduction from your bank account. Right. And that money that went in your bank account came from, you know, the work or whatever it is, and you never touch it. And, and worse yet, because it's credit, I can let some of that ride. And consumer debt is, is really something that entraps people. It's, it's a source of great stress, which can cause health problems. It can be very difficult mm. to get out from underneath that. And even after someone does get out from underneath consumer debt, particularly if, the, if they have to do that in part by declaring bankruptcy, sure. it has implications for their ability to make decisions into the future. And in the moment, people aren't thinking about that. Well, and there's even credit card companies that are inducing retailers to, hey, don't take cash, just take a credit card and we'll give you an incentive. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting kind of sign of the times that we're living in. Yeah. And what that means is that each of us has to take some degree of responsibility for doing what we can to live within the, 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 the money that we've got, the credits that we've got, mm. rather than really borrowing for things that, that, that really don't require us to borrow. You know, and we, we, you know, we talk, uh, we, I we've been able to do a couple of shows. We talked a little bit about uh, on a previous show, uh, on another show about the, um, the fact that a lot of the stuff you buy doesn't really make you happy mm -hmm. in the long term. True. The question is, do you really want to borrow in order to make purchases that ultimately are not going to have a significant positive impact on your life? That's true. Purchases can be... Uh, they have an expiration date in terms of your happiness. That's right. That's right. And it's much shorter than you think. <laughs> That's very true. Well, well, well put, well received. Thank you, Art, for your insights. Dr. Art Markman, so glad to have you with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Okay, time for viewer questions. Now, I've gotten this question actually from a few different people so I'm very glad to bring it to the program today. It's about charitable gift annuities. Now, charitable gift annuities are one type of annuity, 
And of course, as the, the name would imply, they're offered by charities. So let's dig in a little bit to the question. The question comes from Russ in Ormond Beach. Now, that's of course not the person's real name. I always change the name to protect your identity. And so you can also ask me questions that you think, well, is that really a good question? Or gosh, I don't want somebody to judge me. No judgment. Send me your questions. I'm happy to answer them. All right, so let me read the question to you. I have received newsletters from charities suggesting more reliable income for an investment of at least $5,000. The interest rates all seem to be the same, 5.8% for age 75. How can we be sure that the income will be around for the rest of my life? Is it too good to be true? At the time of death, the investment amount would then go to the charity I would be fine with. Is there a website that could verify these charities and their safety? All good questions related to a charitable gift annuity. Now, I want to break this down into parts because uh, there's a lot of questions there all in one question. So let's get started and I'll break it down. First of all, with any annuity, when you hear interest rates, they can either be an actual fixed rate or a lot of times a reference to a rate. And sometimes it's twisted up. They call it an interest rate when it's really not. It's a payout with charitable gift annuities and immediate annuities, which is offered by insurance companies. We'll get to that in a minute. With a charitable gift annuity, the rate that they often talk about is a payout rate. So on $100,000, a 5.8% payout would be $5,800 a year that is paid to the person setting up the annuity. So if you give your money to a charity and they say, we're going to give you a 5.8% payout, they're going to pay you $5,800 a year for the rest of your life. After that, the money is kept by the charity. Now, the second thing is the reliability of your income depends on that charity. You have given the money to the charity. And I really can't overemphasize that. It's not your money anymore. This is an irrevocable transaction. You have made a gift. And you get, in return, income for your lifetime. Now. Next is the question about it being too good to be true. It's not too good to be true, like any financial product, as long as you understand that there are pros and cons. Let's go quickly through these. The pros, there's an immediate tax deduction. Why? You're giving the money to the charity. It's a done deal. They're going to give you a lifetime of income. There's a mathematical formula that determines the tax deduction that's based on your life expectancy. Basically, how much money will be left over, and that's the tax deduction. The other advantage of this is that it's one transaction and there's not really that much expense in setting it up. Now there are cons as well. The charity could default. This is an irrevo irrevocable gift and you've given this money to the charity. If they're not there to pay you, you don't get your money. Now the other potential uh, con is that when you die, there's nothing left over. The money is kept by the charity whether you live a long time or not. Now, evaluating charities, you can go online, visit websites like charitynavigator.org. I would also suggest considering some alternatives to charitable gift annuities. I mentioned insurance companies offering other types of annuities. You can do an immediate annuity where the insurance company is going to pay you a lifetime of income and there's typically nothing left over. Or you can do a fixed annuity where you put your money into the annuity the insurance company pays you a lifetime of income, and then when you die, there's money potentially left over for your heirs. The other advantage about insurance companies versus a charity is that the ratings and the financials of insurance companies are pretty easy to review. That information's pretty well available. And here's the big one from my perspective, from a financial planner's perspective, you can change your mind. Most different types of annuities, but a lot of them that are available, it's not, it's not an irrevocable deal. You can get your money back. There might be some costs, but you can get your money back. So if you want to leave money to a charity, but you're mainly concerned about income during your lifetime, I would favor something that is more flexible and gives you more options. And then if, when you're done with it, it goes to the charity, all good. I like options over irrevocable. Consider these alternatives and you'll plan stronger. 
If you would like more information about the topics and our guests featured in this series, please visit our website at planstrongertv.com. Also, if you have a question you would like David to answer, please send it to questions at planstrongertv.com.